related to ballot measures leading up to this year, um, a bit about what it means for transit overall and why it's important for the country, and then we'll have a story of firsthand success of a city leveraging successful ballot measures to dramatically advance transit. Um, if we could go to the second slide. Uh, I'm honored to be joined today by Richard White, the CEO of APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, uh, and longtime transit champion, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. I'll give you longer introductions for each of them a little bit later in the webinar. I do want to mention from the outset here that we will take questions uh, at the end of the program, and you can enter your questions using the dashboard box on the side of your screen under questions. Just type those in. Um, we'll get them and relay them to the panelists at the conclusion of the program. Um, so Kirsten, if you could go to the next slide. Um, I'd like to start with some, uh, and advance one more please, uh, start with some numbers and some context for this year's races. Um, let me say just a quick word about CFTE uh, at the outset. Um, our organization has been focused on transit ballot measures beginning back in 2000. and We maintain a, a comprehensive data set of all the campaigns that have been uh, run on transit uh, from 2000 um, through this year. Uh, our focus really has been to monitor what's happening around the country, to analyze what works and what doesn't at the ballot box uh, in terms of success for transit ballot measures. Uh, and of course, um, we are uh, supported by and, and were founded by uh, APTA uh, back in 2000. So l let me turn now to the real story, the headline story uh, about election 2016. Um, we have on ballots this year the, the single largest number of measures that we've ever seen in a 12-month in a period again dating back to when we first began monitoring these uh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, in addition, this year's election will see the highest number of states with measures on the ballot. So those aren't necessarily statewide measures, but communities in 25 different states will vote on public transportation investment measures. So that's half of the country, and it's important to keep in mind that uh, many states still don't allow, or at least not allow very easily, um, local communities to go to the ballot. So we're seeing broad geographic distribution of these measures at the same time we're seeing um, a large number of overall measures. Um, and it's the dollar amount that I think has been um, extraordinary this year. Um, the largest that we've seen since we began uh, monitoring these measures, nearly $200 billion at stake uh, on election day uh, at the ballot box for public transportation. And we have reason to be optimistic heading into the election. Um, uh, I'll go through the specific numbers uh, in, a, in a couple moments, but so far this year, 75% uh, of the transit measures that have gone before voters have been successful. So let's dig a little bit deeper into exactly what's uh, on tap this year. Um, here's a map simply showing the overall distribution of the 77 measures. So uh, some of these have already happened and I'll break those out for you in just a second. But you can see here um, what I was referencing in terms of the broad geographic distribution across the states. Um, what's a little harder to discern from this map, but I'll show you uh, in more detail in a second, is that this is a phenomenon that affects all sorts of uh, cities, counties, municipalities, uh, large and small. So we have everything from some of the largest cities in the country uh, to small uh, towns and townships dotted uh, across the landscape. So um, this is a, a broad as well as deep phenomenon. Um, if you could go to the next slide, um, uh, this gives you a sense of exactly what we're looking at in terms of 2016 measures, in terms of what precisely is, is on the ballot in terms of the nature of the funding. And it's important to keep in mind that these are typically uh, tax-related measures. Um, we do have a few advisory measures and, and, and amendments on the ballot this year, but the overwhelming percentage um, involve local taxes or dedicated fees of some sort. Um, this year, uh, pretty evenly split between sales tax and property taxes, uh, and that's been consistent with what we've seen over the course of the last 15 years, that those two things tend to be the dominant tools in the toolbox for these ballot measures. Um, at the same time, uh, it's important to realize that the authorizing legislation for most of these measures uh, doesn't allow a great deal of flexibility. In many states, you either have to go for property taxes or you have to go for sales taxes. 
We are seeing a bit of experimentation around the margins where people are looking at bundled measures and other sorts of dedicated um, revenue sources. Uh, we've had 28 measures go to voters uh, year to date. Um, again, with the aforementioned 75% of those 28 measures um, being successful. Um, I think it's, it's useful to keep in mind as well um, that a, as you look at the map of the country, um, you know, I mentioned that we're in half of the states already, um, but not every state allows the authority. So one of the trends I think we're going to be looking at going forward uh, is more and more communities pushing their states for the authorization um, to go to the voters to use the ballot uh, as a tool for generating investment. I suspect that will accelerate in 2017 and beyond, particularly as communities look around and see how many of their peers across the country are successfully um, using these tools. Um, for Election Day itself, so the 77 measures is the entire universe of calendar 2016. Uh, ballot measures, but looking more specifically at Election Day itself at November 8th, you can see here 49 measures uh, on ballots uh, across the country, again with that familiar distribution of sales, property, taxes, uh, and uh, assorted other constitutional amendments, bond measures, and, and other, other types of, uh, of funding packages. Uh, once again, we see uh, small cities represented, large cities. You'll notice that there's a significant cluster of measures in California. California this year will be home to the, the single largest number of local ballot measures uh, uh, of any state. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind because California also has a supermajority requirement for passage. So when you think about the success rate for these measures, um, for much of the country, that success is built on uh, 50 plus 1 at the ballot box, but in California, that supermajority requirement um, uh, puts an even higher hurdle uh, uh, for, uh, for passage. And California, despite having that supermajority requirement, has a history of being uh, quite successful at the ballot box, um, I think underscoring uh, the, the popularity, the typical popularity of, of these measures um, with voters. If you could go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the uh, notable campaigns that are happening around the country. Let me just say that uh, if you want details on all of the 77 uh, measures that are on ballots this year, um, we do keep a list on the website so you can go through and get more details. But just some of the highlights um, that uh, I, I think are really piquing people's interest in, in ballot measure campaigns this year, of course. Um, the single largest measure in, in Los Angeles County, Measure M, um, would dramatically uh, extend a variety of, of transit services across LA County, um, that being uh, not only the largest measure on the ballots this year, but the largest that we have seen um, since we've been um, counting measures. Uh, there's a combination of sales and bond measures in the Bay Area, supporting transit there. A uh, half cent sales tax in San Diego that would account for more than $18 billion uh, for a transportation investment uh, in, in San Diego County. So again, that's, that's only some of the many measures uh, on ballots in California. Um, we're seeing Atlanta uh, move forward uh, on a number of fronts, and this is really building on some recent successes there. Um, Clayton County, one of their suburban jurisdictions, had success at the ballot box a couple of years ago. Um, the city had success with a bond package um, earlier, uh, and now they're moving forward with a half cent sales tax in the city of Atlanta itself. So after having a setback at the ballot box a few years ago, that region is really now moving forward with a number of, of measures advancing transit um, across that region, and in particular in the city of Atlanta. Um, one of the uh, really interesting races uh, around the country will happen in southeast Michigan, um, the Detroit area, where four counties will uh, go to the ballot box on nearly $3 billion worth of transit investment around BRT lines and commuter rail. Um, so a real effort there in a city almost synonymous with the automobile to uh, consider embracing public transportation in a very aggressive way. Uh, but other places too, Wake County, North Carolina, the Raleigh area would become the final piece of the counties that make up the research triangle uh, to have adopted successful uh, transit measures. There's a half cent sales tax on the ballot there. 
uh, and again, significant dollars uh, at stake in, in all these races. The Raleigh measure would be over $2 billion worth of transit investment. Um, Washington State, home to a number of measures. Um, one of the most talked about around the country would be the Sound Transit 3 measure in Seattle, which is um, a blend of different funding uh, pieces. Uh, and the interesting thing about Seattle, and I think something that makes it perhaps a harbinger for other places across the country, is that the issue there hasn't really been whether to move forward with this, but how fast can they get service to the communities in that region that are, are demanding it. Um, speaking again, I think, to uh, the popularity uh, and the demand for this investment. Um, but Seattle isn't the only action in Washington State. There's a sales tax measure in, in Spokane as well. Again, just to give you a sense that this isn't all uh, just about um, larger communities. Um, we do have some statewide measures. Um, those are less common, um, but we have a bond package in Maine. We have a constitutional uh, transportation trust fund measure in New Jersey, just to name a couple. And as I mentioned before, a, a lot of smaller communities, towns and townships um, dotted around the state of Michigan. Michigan, in addition to their uh, marquee measure in, in southeast Michigan and the Detroit region, uh, nearly 20 different communities across Michigan um, either have been on ballots this year or will be on ballots, most of them um, smaller systems. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, um, I want to give you some sense of where we have been over time. So 2016 certainly shaping up to be uh, a, a very significant year, historic year, um, but there's a, a longer track record here of success. So you can see uh, the support over time. Uh, for uh, these measures. If you add up, aggregate all of the various ballot measures that have gone before voters since 2000, the cumulative win rate uh, is above 70%. 71% of those measures have been successful. If you compare that with other sorts of ballot measures, you would find, we're told by um, political scientists who looked into these uh, referenda, that that success rate is significantly ahead of other kinds of ballot measures. So um, there's something unique and distinctive, I think, about uh, the support that voters have given to uh, these ballot measures that support public transportation investment. And if you'll notice, uh, the success rate um, didn't decline, as you might have expected, with uh, the recession um, or with some of the challenging politics across the country around budgets and taxation, uh, if anything, uh, the phenomenon has, has strengthened over time. Uh, and in an era of fairly dramatic polarization, particularly around uh, tax and spending issues, um, to have 71% approval rate, I think, is, is striking. Um, on the next slide, um, you can see the steady growth in the use of these measures. Um, we split these out because the off-cycle measures, there are fewer places that allow um, communities to go to the ballot in, in non-general election years, um, but you can see that in both cases the trend line has been uh, pretty steadily upward. Um, so 77 on ballots this year, a uh, dramatic new record for, uh, for ballot measures, um, but it really builds on a record that was set a year ago for off-cycle measures when we had uh, uh, the largest number uh, on record in 2015. Um, I think this is in part a reflection of the success of these measures, in part it's a reflection of the challenging investment and budget environment um, at all levels of government uh, for, uh, for transportation investment. Um, and this has become uh, a ready tool uh, and one that has proven popular with voters. Um, if you go to the next slide, this just gives you um, a, a, a final sense of sort of the, the, the mix of funding types that we have seen across the years that we've been watching these measures. Again, the lion's share of these being in the sales tax category and then the overwhelming majority as sales are property tax measures. Um, our, we are seeing some growth in some of those other categories. Um, but, you know, it's important to keep in mind that these are, these are local decisions and local investments using the local tools that are available. Um, one of the things we have seen consistently in these measures is that, in part, their success is driven by people's understanding of the specific benefit and value that they're going to derive out of them, uh, hence their willingness to, um, to use the tax tools at their disposal uh, to provide the investment. Um, 
if you could go to the next slide, Kirsten, I want to turn it over to um, our next panelist, um, give him a, a quick introduction here. Uh, honored to have Richard White um, with us uh, today. He's the acting president and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, he spent his entire career uh, in transit and public transportation, including a decade as general manager and CEO of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Agency. He also led BART in the Bay Area as deputy general manager and later as general manager. Uh, he's also served in senior management roles at Houston Metro, New Jersey Transit, as well as leading private firms and the federal government. Truly someone who has seen every facet of the industry uh, and has a proven record of leadership and understanding of what's happening around the country. Let me turn it over to you, Richard. Approximately $200 billion in funding will be on ballots in 49 communities across the country on November 8th. Uh, this is truly a historic figure that could help transform communities across the country. Uh, think of it this way, a, a local ballot initiative is a catalyst for a community to implement its vision of the future. And the 75% high passage rate that Jason just talked about shouldn't be surprising. Um, and after all, public transportation is important to millions of individuals across the country. In 2015, 10.6 billion trips were taken on public transit, and 34 million passengers are dependent on pu public transportation each and every workday. For many people, it provides access to jobs. Uh, in fact, uh, nearly 60% of trips taken on public transportation uh, for work commutes. It also help, helps uh, people save money. Our uh, latest uh, transit savings report says that on average nationally, a person who switches uh, his or her daily commute from driving uh, a car to taking public transit can save close to $10,000 a year, and that's a lot of money. So with improved public transportation services made possible through passage of a local referendum, more people would have access to jobs and more people would be able to save money. And from the perspective of a community, public transportation's economic impact uh, is tremendous. Uh, every $1 invested in public transportation generates approximately $4 in economic returns. We also know that employers want to locate to communities that have a strong public transportation system so they can have access to the best possible workforce. Uh, many of you are probably aware of all of the commercial and residential development that, that occurs around transit stations. And actually, residential values are increased by more than 40% when they are located near high-frequency transit service. All this adds up to creating an economically prosperous community. Public transportation also helps to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. And additionally, a very recent study uh, released by Opta shows that public transit can make a community uh, much safer since it uh, dramatically uh, reduces automobile crash risk. So as we say at APTA, uh, wherever public transportation goes, community grows. And ballot measures are important catalysts for helping a community grow, and they serve a variety of purposes. A ballot measure might start a new system, renew it, improve it, expand it, or pay for its operations. I'd like to give you two quick examples of past transit ballot measures that have and are making a tremendous difference for these communities. In 2004, voters in the Denver metropolitan area passed a ballot initiative totaling $4.7 billion. And I think if you look at Denver today and where it's heading, it is a much more attractive place for people to live and work. And that's due to the public transportation improvements that are underway, planned, and are actually happening. Their public transportation program is adding 122 miles of commuter rail and light rail service, 18 miles of bus rapid transit, 21,000 new parking spaces at light rail and bus stations, and enhanced bus and rail connections across the eight-county district. Another important uh, a second example is community transit in Everett, Washington. During the recession, uh, this operator was forced to cut their service by really a devastating 37%. Last November, voters passed a sales tax measure to not only restore its lost service, but to expand it as, it as well. And Community Transit is now implementing a major service increase, and in, just did in September, and has ordered new buses as it prepares for future service expansion. So later today, you're going to hear from Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton on how Phoenix is likewise, likewise being transformed 
thanks to the passage of local ballot measures and is now another great success story. Finally, let me uh, end by emphasi emphasizing how important the partnership is between local, state, and federal governments in regard to public funding. If uh, you look at the slide that's now just come up on the screen, you can see that all levels of government, local, state, and federal, contribute to the funding of a public transportation system. While not all local or state funding comes from ballot measures uh, like the ones uh, next week, this chart does illustrate how critical lo local and state funding is as it constitutes about 45% of the total transit funding picture. So in conclusion, successful pu public transit ballots have a track record of positively transforming a community and for, pro for providing improved access to opportunity and quality of life for those uh, that uh, live there. So I really strongly encourage every person who can vote on a public transit referendum on next Tuesday to do so. Uh, not only will you benefit, but so will your community. Thanks for your interest, and I look forward to taking your questions later. Great. Thanks so much. Um, just a quick reminder, if you do have questions, um, feel free to enter those in so that our panelists can take them uh, at the conclusion of remarks. Let me now introduce uh, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Uh, since taking office, Mayor Stanton has worked to build a modern economy that works for every Phoenix family. By boosting trade, investing in biosciences, and lifting up small business, he is leading the way uh, to creating an innovation-based economy in Phoenix. Um, he's also demonstrated commitment to making Phoenix a more welcoming and open place. Under his leadership, Phoenix became the first city to end chronic homelessness among veterans. Uh, and also the first city in Arizona to earn a perfect score on the Human Rights Campaign's City Equality Index. Uh, he attended Marquette University, earned a law degree at the University of Michigan. Uh, before becoming mayor, he served nine years on the city council and also as Arizona's deputy attorney general. In 2005, he won re-election uh, and also successfully led the Phoenix ballot measure that will triple the city's light rail system. It's my pleasure and honor to turn the program over to Mayor Stanton. Well, Jason, thank you very much. It's my honor to, to be on here and talk about what we've done in the city of Phoenix uh, and how the investments we made in transportation has massively advanced our economy in a positive uh, direction. You said many nice things about me and uh, introducing me about some of the things that I've personally worked on, but when it comes to transportation, here's the most important thing. I grew up in a bus family. I grew up in West Phoenix, which is a working class part of the city, and my dad took the City of Phoenix bus every day to and from work to his job selling shoes at J.C. Penney in downtown uh, Phoenix. So I, for as long as I can remember, uh, my family relied on a bus to, to get around, uh, and we couldn't have raised four kids and, and, and put us through college, et cetera, if we didn't have a great public transportation system in the city of Phoenix. So for me, supporting transportation is in my uh, DNA. And so I was lucky enough last year to have the opportunity to lead the way to put Proposition 104 before Phoenix uh, voters. Proposition 104 was part of a 35-year, $32 billion pub infrastructure investment plan for uh, transportation. Uh, and it passed successfully. It passed overwhelmingly. In fact, that was on the same ballot as my own re-election, uh, and both of us got through uh, successfully. With Proposition 104 in Phoenix, we're going to massively expand our light rail system, tripling the amount of light rail in the city of Phoenix, massive improvements to our bus, uh, including longer bus hours, which we just put into place uh, earlier this week. So we started at 4 a.m., and we're going to go to midnight, and we're going to make even more improvements to our bus system next year, massive improvements to dial-a-ride, make the city more bikeable including uh, implementing our complete streets policy, more walkable uh, city, and street repairs as well. Uh, and we're actually implementing, we're beginning the street repairs right away. The reason why it's successful is because we had a strong base to build upon. Phoenix voters had voted on a sales tax in the year 2000 to improve public transportation. It put in the initial 20-mile light rail system that we have. It's been hugely successful. $8 billion of investment has occurred in our city as the direct result of the transportation infrastructure investment that we've already made. Arizona State University, the largest university in the United States of America, has built a significant campus in our downtown. That campus 
which is advancing education, increasing the college attainment rate in our community. That campus doesn't occur if we don't make significant investments in public transportation. Phoenix hosted two years ago the Super Bowl, and we had a million people come to our downtown. We don't have that event hosting massive concerts in our downtown unless we have a significant investment in light rail and public transportation uh, improvements. With Proposition 104, the item that passed our ballot just last year, we're already making plans um, to, move, to uh, bring light rail to the people of South Phoenix, which is a portion of our city that has traditionally been where the highest percentage of Latinos and African Americans. It's a poor part of the city, and we wanted to make sure that we sent a message that that part of our city uh, needs infrastructure investment so that South, the people of South Phoenix have a full and fair opportunity to jump on that light rail and get to ASU downtown or ASU main campus in Tempe or visit employment centers throughout uh, our city. And by the way, give people from throughout the city the opportunity to visit South Phoenix, which is a wonderfully culturally diverse part of, um, uh, of Phoenix. We've been, we've been named as one of 11 Ladders of Opportunities project by the Department of Transportation, the only one west of the Mississippi. So we're working closely with Washington, D.C. to make sure we get support for that uh, project. Although as mayor, I also understand that the relationship between cities and Washington, D.C. is fundamentally different. We need infrastructure investment across the United States of America. But if we wait around for Washington, D.C. to do it, we're going to be waiting a long time. Cities have to be much more self-reliant. Have an honest conversation with your voters about what the needs are in community, willing to put uh, in our case, a sales tax increase on the ballot to ask voters uh, the question, how do you want to how do you want to advance our city? Do you really want to advance our economy and educational opportunities for the people of the of the uh, of the city? Have that honest conversation that you know the money is not going to flow from Washington like it used to. In fact, in our measure, we only estimated that thirty percent of the resources, the matching funds would come from Washington, that the rest was going to come from us here locally. That represents a significant sea change from how cities used to interact with Washington. I think a city like Phoenix in the western United States, one of the largest cities in America, by the way, fifth largest city in terms of population, you know, we embrace the fact that we need to be a little more uh, independent. And we appeal to that, that ethic in our voters when we put that uh, on the ballot. Anyway, the bottom line is this. The existing transportation infrastructure investments that we've made in the city of Phoenix have advanced our economy in tremendous ways. And the people saw it. And that's why they overwhelmingly supported Prop 104, which um, unless LA passes theirs, our investment will be the largest in the country. It's been the largest in the country in a long period of time. Very proud of that fact, because the people of our community saw the direct connection between transportation infrastructure improvements and advancing our uh, economy, building a more innovative uh, export-based economy is directly related to our success in public transportation. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Stan. Appreciate those comments and appreciate um, all the work that you've done personally in, in Phoenix to make these ballot measures happen. Um, we're, we're about to take some questions, so again, if you have questions for any of the panelists, feel free to enter those in. While folks are um, going ahead and putting their questions in, let me kick things off. Um, with a question for uh, each of my co-panelists. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let me start with you. Um, you were a prominent vocal champion of the last uh, campaign in Phoenix. Um, what lessons do you think other elected leaders, other mayors around the country um, should take from your experience in Phoenix? Well, first off, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line for me personally is I needed to be all in. Uh, as the mayor of the big city in the state of Arizona, one of the largest cities in America, uh, I couldn't vote uh, to put, pa uh, put something on the ballot and then you know, passively say to the voters, you guys decide. No, I need to, to show leadership, roll up my sleeves, and get actively uh, in, uh, involved. In fact, in my case, my reelection campaign as mayor and my campaign supporting Proposition 104 in so many ways almost became the same campaign because my vision for advancing the city through public transportation investments was so related to the reasons why uh, I loved being mayor and wanted to be elected for, uh, for four more years. So the reality is you can't hand it off to somebody else. Uh, mayors and other uh, 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 leaders that have a bully pulpit have to 
personally get involved and put their political names and, and reputations uh, behind it. And I don't want to give any advice to any of the mayors uh, in terms of what they should and shouldn't do. I can only tell you what worked in my situation. So my personal involvement, I think, was a big uh, difference maker. We got the business community to support it. The business community, our local chambers of commerce, endorsed our public, infra public transportation infrastructure uh, investment because they understood how important it was from a workforce perspective to be able to get people to and from various employment centers throughout uh, not only Phoenix, but the entire Valley of the Sun. AARP uh, was actually, this was the first local initiative in their history that they supported with Proposition 104 in Phoenix, Arizona. We worked with every neighborhood group, community group. We built a very strong grassroots uh, uh, coalition. Now, it should be noted that in 2000, when we passed our original transportation infrastructure investment, that was four-tenths of a cent, by the way. That was a 20-year measure. Ours in, in uh, last year was a 35-year, $32 billion measure, a seven-tenths of a cent uh, sales tax. You know, when we originally had the vote in 2000, there was a lot of skepticism about whether or not it was too expensive, whether investments in light rail and the bus improvements were really worth the, the level of uh, investment, whether it would be success or whether people would actually ride it. Ironically, uh, for the, the reauthorization and expansion that we did last year, those critics were not there. It, there wasn't an issue about whether people would ride light rail or the buses because they've been overwhelmingly successful. The real issue for us was some people opposed it because they said with changes in the larger transportation landscape, like ride-sharing companies that are coming to the forefront, like driverless cars that are coming to the forefront, will, will the landscape be changing such that we don't need things like light rail? My message to them was uh, that a great city, a great city like the city of Phoenix, needs to provide as many transportation options as possible. And that includes a great airport, a great light rail system, great buses, great bus rapid transit, great bikeability as a city. It's got to be a more walkable city as well, particularly in the urban heart of the city. You've got to provide dial-a-ride. And you've got to be very open-minded to ride-sharing companies and being open to innovative ideas like driverless cars. It's all part of a comprehensive transportation system that provides as many options as possible. One is not the opposite of the other. And supporting uh, uh, ride-sharing companies and supporting other forms of public transportation should not be exclusive of each other. In fact, they very much complement each other. And that was an important argument that needed to be made to overcome some of the critics that were concerned about large-scale fixed route investments. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Dick, let me turn to you for a quick question here. Uh, the New York Times editorial page this weekend wrote a piece about the importance of transportation ballot measures. Uh, and they noted the declining federal share of investment. Um, what do you think the response to this uh, trend, this phenomenon of ballot measures, should be from Washington? Well, I, I'd say we've we've had a long history of a federal role in, 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 in transit investment. It goes all the way back to the 1960s. So it's enduring. Uh, it, it certainly needs to continue, uh, and there, there really must be a, a continuing strong role, uh, even though we just had recent success of the passage of the Surface Transportation FAST Act. I think we need to say the job's not done yet. There's still a lot more to done. And kind of listening to what the, you know, the mayor had to say about you know, cities recognizing that they really have to be a little more self-reliant and independent, and they need to really sort of supplement uh, what Washington is doing in the pace with which uh, Washington can continue to provide support. And those who uh, see the need to go faster are going to the voters uh, and uh, asking for their approvals uh, to, to try to help accelerate a program and in some cases to try to help bring match to the federal program as well. So, you know, I, I think we'll see uh, the communities uh, continue to recognize uh, the importance of supplementing what the feds can do, but I think there, there really uh, always will be and needs to be a role for, for, fed, for the federal government in supporting the surface program, especially the transit program. Great, thanks. Um, have a, a large number of questions queued up here, so let's let's get right to it. Uh, let, let me start with a question for Mayor Stanton. Um, question here about the Prop 104 campaign and the percentage by which uh, the the measure passed. 
it, it, uh, it passed by 56 uh, percent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next right, by the way, that's off the top of my head, so we're going to real time double check, and if I got it wrong, I'll correct the record while we're still on this call. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, and I can note for, for the, the reporters on the line, um, if, if you're interested in some of those historic measures, um, those are archived as well, so you can go back and search by year on the website to, to pull um, the, the win-loss numbers. Um, the next question, and I guess this is for, for anyone on the panel who, who wants to, um, uh, to take it. Um, the question is, obviously many Americans are disgusted and fed up with this year's election. Uh, the two candidates are among the least popular in history. What would you say to motivate those voters who were totally turned off by the presidential race to participate in down-ballot questions? I don't know if our elected official, the mayor, wants to take that one. <laughs> wow, that's a loaded, uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Uh, how many more days before this election over? Six more days? <laughs> All right, well, first off, um, you know, look, uh, the, rea the reality is you're right. Obviously, the president's election is taking up all of the air in the room, if you, uh, if you will, virtually nonstop coverage uh, on the news, and so much of it is negative, that the concern is that voters will be so turned off that there will be a lower voter participation. Unfortunately, by the way, that may be the strategy of at least one of the presidential candidates, but that's a that's a whole different uh, uh, story. Uh, here locally, we have in 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 Phoenix, we have so many important issues down ballot. Uh, in our county, we have a, a sheriff's race. Sheriff Joe Arpaio is a very high profile elected official. I'm support. I personally am supporting his uh, opponent. We're trying to motivate people to suggest you need to participate in that election. We have issues like uh, a minimum wage increase uh, on the ballot that people are almost unaware of, again, because the presidential election is taking up all of the airwaves, um, uh, if you will. I don't know, you know, the, the honest answer is uh, I just use whatever bully pulpit I have to remind people, particularly young people, because this is so critically important. These transportation infrastructure investments are going to be there for a long period of time. They're going to benefit the lifestyle of so many young people. And then everyone on this call knows that as cities are really in the, the, the business of attracting talent, I want my best and brightest to stay here in Phoenix, not move to another uh, city, and I want to attract uh, talent from other communities because they, they, they enjoy the lifestyle uh, here in Phoenix. Public transportation investments are critically important to building that lifestyle that particularly young people, young college graduates, uh, want to have. You've got to be a bike-friendly city. You've got to be a walk-friendly city. You've got to have great arts and culture. You've got to have great public transportation. You've got to be urban. That's so, so in, uh, important. And so really it, it is an important argument to make to young people that even if you uh, aren't excited about the top of the ticket, by the way, you should vote at the top of the ticket. Even if you're not excited about it, you still should vote for, for a candidate at the top of the ticket. But more importantly, or equally as importantly, look at those down-ballot measures, especially local measures, they're the ones that are really going to impact your life, your, your lives day to day in the communities you live in. Jason, the only thing I'd add to what the mayor said is, you know, irrespective of what people may think of the two candidates running for, for president and, and the potential impacts of decision making on down, down ballot issues uh, or, or people who are on the ballot, uh, the, the, the two candidates are talking about the importance of investing in infrastructure. The United States is really lagging behind other modern nations with respect to what we spend on infrastructure. It's going to be the next president's job to frame that issue and to sell it to the next Congress. So this is important. People need to think about how that down-ballot candidate might vote on that infrastructure question. And then just secondly, just to say, you know, the, the message of today is as well is as much about the, the measures that are the local ballot measures that are in front of voters to decide the future of their own communities and the importance of them coming to the, to the polls to, to vote for that as well. Great. Thanks to both of you. Uh, next question is, is one about our statistics. Um, what share of the $200 billion would go to public transit versus roads? Um, I think I can handle this one. Um, the way we calculate that number, that's all transit investment. Now, it doesn't mean that every measure um, that's going before voters is transit only. In many cases, um, there's a mixture of modal investments. Um, what we have tried to do is disaggregate those to try to understand the percentage of funding that is 
um, intended to be allocated for the transit piece. So um, if, you, if you look at the total universe of all transportation measures, that number would be even higher. Um, so the, the approximately 200 billion that we're talking about is a, is a transit uh, investment number. Um, next question here, um, what's the reason these kinds of measures are becoming more common? Well, I, I think it was it was already kind of said is that uh, you know people uh, don't want to wait for the natural progression of what has been the traditional way of seeing these uh, large scale uh, multi year transit investment projects to be developed, planned, developed, funded, and implemented. Uh, people want to see these move faster. So you know there is the there is the uh, the interest to go for some more self help uh, to do that. Uh, to both uh, accelerate the implementation of a program and also to generate local money to help match uh, a federal program. In the old days of the federal government spend, spending 80% uh, uh, of a new transit project are long gone. It's m much closer, the norm is much closer to the 50-50 percentile. So, so, so people who want to see these investments happen in their lifetime and for their uh, uh, children and children's children to be able to take advantage of, uh, they want to see it, see it speed it up and to sort of supplement uh, the role that the federal government is playing by put, putting local dollars to work. I would just add, this is Greg Stanton, uh, I would just add, um, we see more of these measures because people like public transportation. You provide great public transportation options. Our experience here in Phoenix, people use it. I mean, Phoenix uh, has sometimes been described as the ultimate suburban sprawl uh, city. And yet when we have put significant transportation infrastructure in place, including light rail, it's been overwhelmingly popular, well beyond what the original proje uh, ridership projections were. And once pr once somebody has that experience, a uh, good experience on a bus or light rail, they're they're a supporter from from the, for the rest of their lives. So people want these projects. They understand. They intuitively understand that these projects do help improve the lives of so many people in the community. Uh, to to be able to get easier to work or school or doctor appointment. Etc. And we see so much urban style development up and down the light rail line, particularly near the light rail uh, stops. And living a more urban lifestyle is so much more popular these days. Cities are going through a renaissance all over the country, including here in Phoenix, where most of the action is in the heart of the city, in downtown and and uh, and midtown. And not just young people, but a lot of empty nesters are choosing to sell their large home with a large yard and move to the heart of the city in a multi-housing uh, environment along a light rail line uh, where they can walk or take light rail to the symphony ballet or opera or the other things that they love to visit uh, anyway. So it's, uh, it's really, people, people want these items. They want to advance their cities and it's really the, the public that's demanding it. I have a question here from a reporter in the Virginia Beach area where there is a, a referendum on the ballot um, regarding light rail. Um, they say that uh, the political fighting has been extremely bitter um, and the question is how would you characterize the tone of campaigns around transit ballot measures across the country? Um, I don't know, Mayor Stan, if you want to talk about the tone and the, the two campaigns in Phoenix? Well, uh, you know, look, uh, you have political people on both sides of the uh, of the issue and, and in our case uh, we had a hard fought but yet respectful uh, campaign so at least in our community um, it was one heck of a Donnybrook as it should be we, you know when you're talking about investment at the level that we're talking about we should have a healthy uh, public uh, dialogue but in terms of the ugliness uh, of it uh, I guess in Phoenix we were fortunate to uh, to avoid that I would just say, you know, having looked at a lot of these races, um, it, it's it's variable um, in in some communities, um, particularly in, in races over renewals of existing levies. Um, it can be a pretty low profile campaign without a lot of organized opposition. Um, but as the mayor said, you know, um, these can these can attract uh, folks who have very strong points of view about. Uh, taxes and, and federal, um, excuse me, local budgets and, and investment in, in these projects. Um, so there's no question that uh, in many instances the higher profile campaigns do 
do attract opposition. Um, I, I don't know that I would characterize it as particularly uh, nasty in terms of being personal, um, but it is certainly spirited in, in some places, and I think it generally reflects, um, you know, uh, philosophical disagreements in those communities sometimes between coalitions who, uh, who are interested in, uh, in, in more investment uh, uh, versus um, folks who are, who are um, anti-tax. And, and then we have seen, as that national question has waxed and waned, um, it, it affects these local measures. But again, um, very telling, I think, that um, despite sort of that national tone that can be uh, very negative on these issues, that, that the measures in general have been um, very successful. Uh, next question relates to uh, private uh, uh, funding and public-private partnership models. Uh, and, and the question is, um, in, in cities that use these ballot measures to advance projects, uh, is there room, once you have done that, for tapping into private capital? Yeah, I mean, I think the exam one of the two examples I gave of what was a recent success in the past is really the poster child uh, for the answer to your question, and that's uh, Denver. Uh, D Denver uh, put together, is, implemented, uh, is implementing uh, a, a big portion of their uh, light rail and commuter rail program through a public-private partnership. Uh, it is one of the largest uh, uses of P3s for a transit program uh, in the United States. States. Actually, quite frankly, it's really the first uh, instance of a true uh, P3 model where there's private equity investment put at risk uh, as a part of the program, and it's been a very uh, successful contracting model. So I know uh, a lot of people are sort of anxious to, um, you know, uh, watch the uh, as that unfolds. It's longer-term success uh, here in Maryland with the Purple Line, although not on the ballot, uh, it is going to be another step forward for with P3s. Around the world, it's, it's, it's much more common than it is in the United States. North of the border in Canada, uh, it's a very uh, big tool for advancing infrastructure and transit projects. So I think there is a very uh, a continuing uh, and evolving uh, role for more of that. I think more of our transit agencies are seeing the potential benefits of that. There's a big difference usually between whether it's a, a, a greenfield project, you know, a start from scratch new project, uh, which usually lends itself a little bit more to this model than a something that's an extension of an existing system, but uh, I, I think there is growing acceptance in the transit community uh, for the use of P3s when the conditions are right. Great. Uh, next question uh, is uh, whether there's any indication uh, how the measures on the ballot um, will do on election. Um, I can certainly do get that started. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we've had 20 measures already voters this year with three quarters of those passing. Um, so when you combine that figure with a much longer historic record going back to 2000 of 71 percent, I think we can be reasonably confident that we'll, we'll have uh, a solid majority of the measures uh, on ballots pass. Um, now that said, I, I would caution that, you know, Nearly 20 of the measures will be subject to that supermajority requirement, which is a, an awfully high hurdle um, for, um, for, for those advocates to clear. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, but I think there's a good cause for optimism um, for the communities that have measures on ballots uh, next week. Um, the next question uh, is about the growth of these measures and whether there is a concern of exhaustion or reaching the limit of local taxation, um, or is that possibility uh, too far down the road to worry about? Well, I mean, I think as some of the data that you know it, it's been said in the comments, um, you know, I think the, I think the key to all of this is that. The local communities and those who are asked to vote on these measures have to have uh, a high degree of confidence, uh, you know, in the ability to deliver these uh, projects and programs. It must be the outgrowth of a very participatory process. I think the, you know, the mayor clearly spoke to the importance of the community input and planning process, and 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 that is absolutely critical. So when it's it, when it's inclusionary, uh, when it's based on a good uh, integrated uh, planning process, 
when the business community uh, and others have an opportunity uh, to participate, uh, I, you know, I, I think then uh, the public has a good basis to determine in their confidence, and they can then, then they can also then make value judgments of the investment uh, in this versus investments that uh, that the local communities have to have to make in other important uh, program areas as well. The only thing I'd just Greg saying, the only thing I'd add on that is, in my experience, people don't mind uh, spending taxpayer money on occasion even increasing uh, uh, resources as long as they don't believe the money's going to be wasted, as long as they know it's going to go for valuable projects that are going to advance their local uh, economy. And with public transportation, at least in the city of Phoenix, when we have placed these items before the voters, we've had good, solid, detailed plans on how the money was going to be spent. Obviously, we've built up a track record of success of keeping our, uh, our promises. And so the public's willing then to invest uh, even more. So you know the anti-tax folks, I think in general, if they're just going to be against taxes at all, well that's that's probably not a winning argument. Uh, of course, they're against wasted taxes as they should be. But I think these measures in Phoenix and throughout the country have proven to be good, solid, solid, long-term, valuable investments, and people are willing to put put their money uh, in in favor of those sorts of projects. Next. Uh, is related to the rise of private ride-sharing services and, and how it has affected or may affect um, support for um, ballot measures and, and transit-related infrastructure. Is um, about whether uh, young people will continue to um, support these measures in light of the rise of uh, private ride-sharing services. Thoughts from either of you on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's, what's important is that there are a set of options that are available to people on how to meet their mobility needs. And I, I think, you know, for, for a good chunk of those that involve carrying large numbers of people, you know, that's going to be a line haul transit system, usually a, a rail system uh, or a very, very high quality a bus rapid transit system to do that. But we are really seeing transformations in mobility. Uh, you know, there's really a paradigm shift with uh, ride-sharing services with the Lyfts and the Ubers, uh, and I think what we're seeing is really uh, an embracing of that with respect to their very important roles that can be uh, provide that can uh, uh, that can be served uh, by these new uh, um, mobility options, uh, and they are going to be a growing and important part of the future, uh, and they need to be a part of the entire balanced network because today uh, somebody may uh, want to use a ride-sharing service or a bike-sharing service. Uh, or a walking on one end uh, of the trip and needing a, a car service on the other end of the trip that's delivered by a light rail system. So this is all about a multimodal uh, integrated uh, network of choices for people who live in communities to meet their mobility needs in ways that reduces their dependency uh, on the single occupant automobile, which really, uh, you know, over time, you know, has sort of led, uh, you know, led to some of the serious uh, challenges that our community has on the dispersal uh, and, uh, and, and sprawl, uh, congestion, and, uh, and air quality. Uh, and, you know, the millennials and the empty nesters and others, uh, you know, the mayor spoke of the kind of the, 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 the greater density and urbanization pockets that are sort of coming up around these light rail investments. You know, it's really about a, it's really about a package of options, including these services, but uh, uh, driven by the the bulk, uh, the the really the workhorse, which is the line haul transit uh, service. I think uh, this is Greg Stan. I think uh, with regard to the ride sharing companies, is probably a a greater long term threat to the traditional automobile industry. The idea that every person has to own their own car and when they're not using it, park their car in a garage or a parking space uh, somewhere is probably a greater threat to that traditional model than it is to public transportation infrastructure investments. And of course. You know, when the ride-sharing companies work with public transportation, uh, it can be the results can be great. We talked about public-private partnerships. You know, what about using ride-share companies to help solve the last mile or two-mile problem in public transportation, which is one of the the vexing issues that public transportation officials throughout the country have to deal with? Is you know, if you you're going to take light rail, but your appointment is a mile or two away from the light rail stop. Uh, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to necessarily take your personal vehicle, take light rail to the end of the line, and then jump on a ride-sharing uh, operator and uh, and get to your doctor appointment or to your school or uh, or whatever. So, actually, I would argue that 
working together, ride-sharing companies and public transportation can um, leverage each other to maximum effect. Next question is about uh, the pros and cons of bonds versus sales or property taxes um, when they're on the ballot. Um, I can just say that um, CFT, we have looked at this um, at least in terms of, of pass rates um, and found perhaps not surprisingly um, that bond measures tend to pass um, at the highest rate of any of the, the different tools that are available. Um, but not by a whole lot, and, and in fact, there's not a whole lot of differentiation among the three tools that were, were mentioned there, bonds, uh, sales taxes, and property taxes. Uh, but I don't know that there's statistical evidence to say one is, is much more uh, popular than the other, uh, and, and typically, as I, I think I mentioned in my earlier remarks, most communities uh, don't have a great deal of choice about what tool they take to voters. Um, either they're locked in by existing um, legislative or, or constitutional language, or they've got a, um, a, a, a specially adopted authorization to go to the voters that, that puts in a, a, you know, a particular funding mechanism. Um, but in general, bond, bond measures are a much smaller percentage of the overall universe of ballot measures. They do tend to pass a little bit more frequently, um, but not by a great deal. Um, I, I don't know if either of, of the other panelists uh, ha have thoughts about the, the differences between those those tools. I do not. That was, good. That right. was a good. I think a lot a lot of it comes down to the kind of the local affordability and its uh, ability to assume more debt and you know the, the predictable nature of having a funding source to incur that debt so you can spend now and move projects along faster and and, and pay later. So I think that's kind of the the choice that gets made uh, between the various options. Great. Um, we're coming close to the top of the hour. Take one more question here. Um, there are a few others in, in the queue that we're not going to have a chance to get to, but we will follow up with you um, separately to get your questions answered. Um, but the next question here is about climate change and its connection to these measures. The question is, what impact would the ballot measures have on climate change on an aggregate level and on an individual level? And are carbon emissions a concern with voters? I can I can start there um, um, on the latter issue um, perhaps um, I, I think it's very um, context specific uh, and different communities approach the benefits of transit investment and and which ones to focus on uh, in different ways so the kind of, of campaign that we might see run in in some communities where there's a strong demonstrated uh, interest in, in climate or uh, other sort of environmental stewardship issues, you tend to see that issue reflected more prominently in the campaign. Uh, in other places, um, you know, it, it's it's more focused on uh, the economic impacts, perhaps. Um, although, as 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 APTA would be quick to tell you, um, there's lots of good statistics to suggest that there there are benefits across the board, whether you're talking about economy or or environment, um, to um, to transit investment. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that, you know, APTA has sort of had, you know, various types of studies done on this, you know, one of which, you know, we, we show that transit saves uh, 37 million metric tons of carbon emissions a year, so that's a pretty compelling statement. But I would also say, you know, kind of apropos to the, it's, it's, it's kind of really unique to the local conditions and the local situations, but more and more uh, 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 infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure systems and networks and assets across the country have to pay more and more attention, you know, to the issue of um, resiliency. Are they resilient, you know, to the impacts of uh, climate change? But are they, are they resilient to the, you know, to the impacts of uh, hurricanes uh, and, and other uh, sorts of issues that, that manifest themselves? So I think we have to have, you know, a network that uh, is as resilient uh, as it can be. And I know uh, some transit systems, when they take the opportunity to engage in reinvesting in the system, uh, they look at opportunities to improve the uh, resiliency of the system uh, to protect against uh, future potential impacts. The only thing I'd add on that is uh, in Phoenix, Arizona at least, uh, when I became mayor five years ago, a book had just been published called Bird on Fire, which made the argument that Phoenix was the least sustainable city on planet Earth. <laughs> so that's how, I, that's how I started my tenure as, uh, uh, as mayor. 
I personally have made climate change issues and sustainability a very important part of my administration, improving on that. In fact, Phoenix recently received the U.S. Conference of Mayors Award for our, our climate policies. We actually were ranked number one in the entire country for our, our uh, climate policies. That being said, on the specific issue of the ballot measure, Proposition 104, that passed last year in Phoenix, the argument that was made to the public involved, uh, number one, connecting people to education, two, connecting people to employment uh, centers, and three, the investment, the private sector investment that had been already made along light rail, the $8 billion and all the benefits that went along with it. Uh, the argument about sustainability and climate change and how greater transportation infrastructure investment would help the city of Phoenix uh, uh, achieve our goals as it relates to sustainability, I would argue that was more of a secondary argument uh, that was made to those communities that cared more passionately about it. It wasn't a what I would describe as a general market ar argument that we made on behalf of uh, of transportation. Although as a substantive matter, we know that uh, if we're going to achieve our goals as it relates to sustainability and fighting climate change, it's not, it's not going to happen through Congress. It's going to be cities and mayors that step up to the plate and show leadership. So it's an incredibly important issue, and I don't want to in any way suggest that it's, it's, it's a tier two issue. It's a very critically important issue. But as it relates to the arguments we made to the public on for the ballot measure, it was not one of our primary arguments. Great. Well, we've, we've run out of time. I want to say uh, a special word of thanks to my uh, panelists, uh, Mayor Stanton from Phoenix. Thank you very much. Dick White from APTA. Thanks as always. Um, if anyone on the line has uh, other information needs or questions, um, please do feel, uh, uh, feel comfortable reaching out to CFTE and the team at APTA. Um, you can see some of our contact information there on the screen. Um, we will be tracking all of the measures uh, on, uh, on ballots on Election Day, so um, look to our websites and, and look to our social media feeds for information on what we anticipate will be um, a very successful night at the ballot box for transit and a historic year uh, for transportation ballot measures. Thanks to everyone for joining us.